Welcome to the Think Wider webinar series, News Perspectives on Domestic Revenue Mobilization. I'm Kunal Sen, the Director of UNU Wider. This is the fifth edition of the Think Wider webinar series, New Perspectives on Domestic Revenue Mobilization. And the title of today's webinar is The Potential of Domestic Savings in the Global South. Now, we know that domestic financing plays a crucial role in the growth prospects of developing countries. One of the very important silence facts we have on economic growth is that countries with higher domestic savings tend to experience higher economic growth than others. However, we see a large variation in savings rates across the world. For example, Sub-Saharan Africa's average savings rate in 2222 is 22%, as compared to 30% in South Asia and 36% in East Asia. Clearly, this may have implications for economic growth in these regions. So how can we increase savings rates in developing countries, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa? What are the drivers of savings rates? And what are the instruments available to policymakers to increase savings? What is the role of macroeconomic policy and financial reforms? How can we think of new sources of long-term capital for developing countries, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa? So we're going to try and address several of these questions in the next one hour, and we're going to bring together academia and policymakers, policy, uh, policy uh, analysts in this discussion and try to get a sense of the real challenges facing developing countries, increasing savings, and what we can do about it. So let's get started. And I'm going to introduce now the panelists in turn as they speak, and then I'm going to ask them to speak for about seven to eight minutes on a specific question I'm going to ask, ask them. And then we're going to have time for about 30 minutes for question and answers. So let me introduce the panelists. So first we have Rose Ungugi, who is the Executive Director of the Kenya Institute for Public Policy Research and Analysis, Kipra and Short, Kenya's leading think tank. She's involved in providing technical guidance, capacity building on policy and strategy formulation, for the government of Kenya. Prior to joining Kipra, Rose was a senior advisor in the IMF. She's been a member of the Central Bank of Kenya, the Monetary Policy Committee, and she has vast teaching experience in the University of Nairobi School of Economics. Welcome, Rose, to the webinar. We also have Tobias Rasmussen, who's at the IMF and as a resident representative in, the, in, in Kenya, and where, he's also, and where he's also been working also in many other countries in Africa and elsewhere. So he was a mission chief for Guinea-Bissau, and he's also worked in Ghana and Zambia. Tobias also worked in countries in the IMF's Asian, Middle Eastern, and Western Hemisphere, Western Hemisphere European departments. Welcome, Tobias, also to the webinar. And then third, we have Amir Labdoe, who's a development economist and lecturer in the political economy of development at SOAS, the University of London. Amir has worked before in the, at the LSE as a Channing House Research Fellow. Thanks, Amir, for joining us in this webinar. We're expecting a fourth panelist Chukuna Undugu, who is the Cabinet Secretary of the National Treasury, the Economic Planning of Kenya. Dr. Undugu is before that, before he joined as Cabinet Secretary very recently in the National Treasury, he was the Executive Director of the Africa Economic Research Consortium based in Nairobi, and also held the position of the Government of Kenya Central Bank Governor from 2007 to until March 2015. So I'm going to ask now each of the panelists one question to, to get started. And then we're going to try and have further questions as we have in the, in the, Q in the Q and A. So the, my first question is to Rose. Rose, the question I have for you, and this is to link to the overall question we're trying to answer in this, in this webinar, is what are the drivers of savings in the, in the developing world? What are the policy challenge, challenges in increasing savings, especially based on the Kenyan experience? And what do you think are the instruments that policymakers can use to increase savings in the short to medium term? Over to you. So Rose, uh, you can go ahead. Just a moment, we will, yeah. I think I'm okay now. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Th thank you very much, uh, Professor Kunal. Um, I think uh, the topic we are looking at today is um, very critical, uh, given that uh, uh, for any country to 
uh, actually see economic growth, they need to invest. And for them to invest, uh, they need to mobilize uh, resources. So I'll, I'll, I'll go quickly through some slides, uh, try and uh, uh, bring out uh, the key issues uh, uh, that I find in Kenya, and, uh, and they'll be responding to the questions that you have asked. So, um, okay. So the first thing that uh, um, uh, that is motivating uh, uh, this work is uh, to say that, uh, as you have observed, uh, the savings levels are very low. And uh, uh, if you try to compare uh, where Kenya was in the uh, 70s and where it is uh, since uh, mid 1990s, you'll notice that uh, we are yet to get back to the levels of saving uh, that we had uh, uh, before even we liberalized the market in 1991-92 uh, period. So uh, this has seen uh, the savings gap actually uh, increase. But over time, uh, we have seen the government uh, put up uh, various initiatives uh, to enhance uh, uh, savings. Uh, for example, um, in various uh, development plans since uh, uh, independence, the government has uh, uh, emphasized on uh, uh, saving, saving culture. And in the recent uh, um, uh, long-term development agenda, that is the vision uh, 2030, uh, the expectation is that uh, we'll grow our savings from about 15.6% uh, of GDP. Uh, that is just before the, uh, the vision 2030 implementation started uh, to about, um, Sorry. You can hear me? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, all right. Sorry, I had seen like uh, uh, there's a fluctuation. Yeah, to about 26% uh, in 2012, 2013, and uh, all that uh, with a vision to have uh, to reach at 29% uh, by 2030. At the moment, we are very far behind even uh, 20, the 200603 levels of 15.6%. Uh, in addition, uh, the government has really put a lot of effort in establishing uh, channels to facilitate the savings, including the uh, establishment of the uh, NSSF for long-term uh, 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 savings, uh, commercial banks, including the National Bank and uh, Cooperative Bank and others. A lot of reforms have also gone into the capital markets and other platforms have also been uh, uh, established. In addition, uh, Kenya actually has gone through the liberalization process uh, for the financial sector, uh, but our interest rate policy has seen uh, reversals. Uh, we, we saw one, uh, an attempt uh, in early 2000s, and recently, of course, we had the interest rate capping, uh, which again has been uh, uh, reversed. Further is the commitment uh, for the government to uh, fiscal, sust fiscal sustainability, in, uh, in, uh, in the aim of uh, mobilizing uh, uh, public uh, uh, savings. Uh, if we look at uh, what has been happening in the space of uh, uh, savings channel, you'll notice that uh, since uh, 2006 to the current period, uh, using the data that is collected from uh, um, uh, fin access, you'll notice that there has been a, a shifts across uh, the various sources, say, for example, the post bank uh, is going down, uh, but there's a heavy increase in mobile money uh, uh, channel that is now being used. A lot of uh, uh, activity also for group and, and, and channels, these are just social groups that uh, are being used by various uh, 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 members of the society. But in addition is the motivation to save, it's very diverse. Uh, there are those who are saving, uh, 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 targeting uh, to either buy a house, targeting to do ordinary things in the in the household, targeting to finance in to finance education. Uh, but there are also others that are uh, in that are saving actually to uh, invest. Uh, for example, in the agricultural input as well as uh, in uh, uh, other uh, other other elements. Uh, significant shock have hit the market. Uh, for example, if you look at um, uh, 
uh, the inflation element, you'll notice that in 1992 uh, period, when we had a very sharp uh, increase in inflation, and uh, also in 2007, these are critical, uh, critical, critical points that you can see also the savings level are uh, responding to. Um, and when you look at uh, the deposit rate and the savings level, I, I tried to get colors, but they couldn't get, but this element here, uh, I have the deposit rate. The deposit rate uh, fell so sharply uh, in 2002 with a new government uh, coming in and the economic recovery strategy uh, being implemented. It fell very sharply and at the same time, uh, you can see also uh, a decline in the savings uh, rate which has not been recovered uh, since that time. Other developments that are important to note is uh, the demographic dynamics. Uh, if you look at the population for Kenya, uh, we have a very big uh, population of zero to 17, over 50%. But over time, uh, you'll notice that uh, the youth uh, entering the 18 to 34 uh, bracket are actually uh, increasing which means that uh, for us to move forward with the, with the enhancing the uh, domestic savings, then we have to cater for that youth that is entering uh, the, work, the work level. Uh, in terms of the deficit, as I've, as I've indicated, uh, there's been a, uh, an attempt to uh, really uh, uh, tame the increase in the, in the fiscal deficit. But of course, over time, uh, we've seen that there are various demands that have come especially with the new government, uh, you know, structure, uh, the devolution process, and other shocks that have hit the country uh, since uh, uh, 2010. So in the analysis that we have done, uh, looking at uh, private savings uh, function and uh, using the life cycle model, we tried to uh, analyze the factors that are influencing uh, uh, savings behavior in the country. And what you see in red are those factors that are not significant, either in the short run or in the long term. And for this private uh, savings uh, uh, framework, what you notice is that uh, public or fiscal uh, policy uh, plays a, a key role uh, in uh, uh, enhancing your uh, private savings. Uh, shocks even from uh, external sources uh, measured by the terms of trade also have an implication as far as the uh, savings are concerned in the long term. Uh, although wealth uh, is uh, having a negative effect in the short term, that effect is not uh, uh, significant in the long run. Inflation uh, is uh, significant both in the short term and in the long term, but in the short run, there seems to be uh, a lag uh, of one uh, with a positive uh, and significant implication on, uh, on savings. Per capita income, uh, as usual, is a, is a key factor uh, in terms of uh, enhancing uh, savings. And it's one of the areas that the government, even in the development plan, was trying to focus on, uh, seeing that uh, the low income earners were not actually uh, saving a lot. Uh, deposit rates, uh, this is giving us a, a negative effect uh, in the short run, but in the long run, it's negative, but not a, a, a significant uh, aspect of uh, how the income effects and the abstention effects are playing a part is what is determining the sign for the deposit rate. Uh, further is the age dependency ratio uh, has a positive uh, effect. And as you can see from uh, the demographic uh, 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 dynamics that are in Kenya, you can actually tell uh, where this is coming from. When we looked at the national savings uh, framework, we had uh, very few uh, factors that uh, were influencing uh, savings. And of course, the national savings have uh, uh, other aspects in addition to the private savings. We have also the, the government savings. And the only factors that uh, tended to be uh, significant uh, were the terms of trade, and of course, inflation and the financial development uh, was uh, uh, giving us a negative, uh, a negative uh, 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 sign, and uh, agency, age dependency was not uh, uh, significant. From this, uh, the policy implications that we were drawing from it 
is uh, one, uh, fiscal sustainability, uh, given the implication that it has on uh, private savings. Uh, external shocks uh, are very, very critical and uh, uh, seeing the implication that it has on uh, exchange rate as the path to uh, uh, savings uh, through interest rates. Uh, price stability uh, to enhance uh, uh, enhancing price stability and of course for example in Kenya uh, price stability is uh, really determined by food inflation and that would be the very core area that uh, we need to work on to, en to ensure that price stability is maintained. Uh, quality and inclusive economic growth it's not just uh, having economic growth uh, what we found very significant is the per capita income so enhancing per capita income means that we, we must have quality uh, inclusive economic growth. Uh, for the interest rate policy, uh, this is uh, crucial and um, the reversals uh, in the policy can themselves uh, create uncertainty in the market. So trying to ensure that uh, uh, we sustain the interest rate policy uh, makes, may, uh, gives uh, uh, certainty to the, to, to the savers. Job creation, uh, to absorb the increasing youth category. As I've indicated, uh, they are all shifting towards uh, uh, entering the labor market. And what we need is uh, actually to sustain them with uh, uh, decent jobs so that they are able to enhance the savings. And of course, uh, finally, is uh, looking at uh, beyond um, uh, the financial savings, uh, the uh, non-cash savings, uh, given that uh, uh, sometimes uh, the targeted savers, they don't, they, after they have put their savings and they have gotten their assets, they again start again with the, with the targeting uh, for savings. It was given seven minutes. Thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Rose. Actually, I mean, uh, one of the important things you mentioned uh, was on macroeconomic stability and price stability. There's an open question that given the high inflation rates we're seeing in Africa and also obviously in other developing countries and also in, de in developed countries, what does it mean for savings going forward, given we know that say inflation can be quite detrimental, high inflation can be quite detrimental to savings. I should also mention, I should have mentioned that earlier that the paper that you drew from in your presentation is on the UNU wider website. Uh, it's part of a project on domestic savings shortfall in developing countries, what can be done about it. It's already a wider working paper, and we have already have a link to the working paper in the chat, um, so you can so others can take a look at the paper. It's a very important paper, and it's very uh, very rich uh, empirical analysis. So definitely worth reading um, uh, for 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 those who are interested in this area. So I want to move on to now. I think I've actually now see Dr. Undugo online, and so actually uh, I have already introduced you, Dr. Undugo, because I thought I knew that you might be joining with late. So maybe I think it's important that we move on to you because the some of the implications that came from uh, Rosengu's presentation, mobile money and so on, is important for to understand that how important is that for overall savings, not only in Kenya but also, of course, in the African continent. So the question I had for you, uh, if I can just jump into the question, then is what is the role of fintech in increasing savings in Kenya but also in in in, Af in Africa? What can Kenya's experience so just for the rest of Africa, and what are the challenges on trying to increase fin uh, on trying to use fintech for mobilizing, mobilizing savings? Uh, over to you, Adunduk. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you so much. And um, um, let me say that I'm very happy to be in that, this part of the program. And um, <laughs> I'm sorry because I think my life has become uh, difficult to plan. <laughs> I kept on uh, trying kept on trying to defend this time, but uh, somewhat uh, I was almost getting, I had to chase people away from my office. Uh, I think uh, Tobias has, is not in the same kind of problem or rules like I am in. Let me say this is a subject matter I really quite appreciate and like, because I come, I've come a long way with it uh, since uh, 2007. But in actual fact, what we introduced in 2007 has become very, very important. In fact, what we introduced, although it is an embodiment of mobile phone financial services uh, platform, it was actually a retail electronic payments platform. 
and which by the mere fact that is a retail electronic payments platform, it, it, it talks to itself in a number of ways. Of course, the first general conclusion everybody makes is that once you have a retail electronic payments system that is efficient and transparent and effective and also safe, it means that it opens the, it is going to be a game changer. And for me, that is a very, very important concept, especially in a world where you have segmented markets. There's, if you have a product like that that can navigate across segments of the market, that is actually a very, very important uh, contribution to the whole ecosystem. But then moving further, it's actually, it creates what we call accessibility. But most people don't realize how that solves myriad of constraints when it, it, it increases accessibility. In Kenya, of course, the initial, uh, the initial, should I say, achievement, as Rose has just said, is actually financial inclusion. But financial inclusion itself, it was on the services bait. But within no time, banks realized that, oh, here we have a technological platform that can actually help us manage micro accounts, micro accounts, whether it's micro savers or micro depositors or even micro lending. All those things went hand in hand and the developments are quite pervasive and i'm very happy that um, i managed after a long struggle in uh, my work to actually come up with a case study of mpesa and i think i've shared it across and it's also in the arc website which i think i liked a lot and i made sure that i, I finalized it even after many years but within it i've done i've, I've covered so many papers but the most important thing is that the constraint, of course, one, the, one of those successes, one success led to another. Let me give you a chronology of events. The payment system is working. It encourages banks to use that payments platform to actually uh, introduce virtual savings account and virtual reading accounts. It allows us, it allows the banks also to correct credit scores so that they can actually change the collateral technology. And finally, you find that then there is space for everyone to participate and even to use that, that system. Those benefits are quite clear. And for, 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 for purposes of even uh, that space, it also brought in so many other, so many other uh, actors in the service that you, you did not even need to go to look for those services. For example, e-government services work. In, 19, in 2017, IMF came up with a volume uh, that uh, the, the title was, digitization and the design of public finance. And one of the arguments was that, one of the strong conclusions was that the digitization can actually lead to a new design of public finance. One, because even tax payments platforms can be developed, but more importantly, revenue administration would be very effective and minimize leakage. And for us, that's a very important conclusion coming up. So essentially, we've gone through that. But because I also want to make sure that I save on time and maybe uh, uh, other issues, let me say that banks developed that very fast, but there were emerging issues. In one of my, 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 my papers and even the case study, I actually argue that we need to push this frontier forward. So let me present four points that would uh, push the market, which also, if you flip the other side, it would show that there were disadvantages or there are constraints in the market. The first thing is that if this is the game changer, if the retail electronic payments is the game changer, then it means that we have to widen the physical infrastructure of the fiber optics so that the telecoms can actually ride on that that physical infrastructure and create the core infrastructure, which is now M-Pesa, which is riding on the physical infrastructure. Because no one should be left behind if this is the game changer, then it means that we have to make sure that the, we have widespread connectivity. So connectivity becomes a solution for the future, but it's also for countries or even in the same country where regions are not covered, it becomes a, a major problem. So make sure that no one is left behind. The second thing is that, I am one strong believer of development of markets, but for us to develop the markets, we also need to nudge the markets into the optimal path. We have to regulate that market, and more importantly, we have to protect that market. Most of the time, 
markets fail to achieve the desired goals, and especially when we come to savings, for example, we come to digital reading, virtual savings in Kenya, and because somehow, somewhere, we dropped the ball. I'll give you an example. One of the things that we did was we, we were, I praised the whole idea of coming up with credit scores, generating credit scores, which you could change the collateral technology. But all of a sudden, another regulator who regulates betting, uh, digital, bet, digital, uh, digital lending and digital betting cannot be good, uh, 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 they could be strange uh, bed fellas, was that most people could borrow the, the digital, uh, they could borrow uh, virtually and uh, go into digital betting. In the end, they don't win the bets. So essentially they accumulate debts and then the credit scores, instead of worsening, they get into CRBS they are, and, 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 they are, and, they, and they are blacklisted. So you can see that instead of using the credit scores positively, the, the CRB uses it as a binary tool. So in a sense, it becomes quite problematic. That is something that is an institutional failure problem. Let me move to the second problem. Now, the, the second advantage. One of them is that most countries, especially in Kenya, we succeeded because we had an, an identity card or an identity number system. But we need to move on to an electronic ID system. An electronic ID identifier is going to secure the market. It's going to be a security to the market. That is something that is quite important. The third one, which is an institutional failure problem, or it can be an institutional failure problem, it can be a constraint, is actually thinking about the whole idea of um, uh, how different payments, is, because this is where most, the, the ready telcos developed the idea. The first mover advantage can be actually very good, but success has its own, has its own pitfalls. So you found that, especially in Kenya, everybody gives the Kenyan example, there is a monopoly, uh, but it is a first mover advantage. Why I say it's a pitfall for success has its own pitfalls is that because of that success, everybody wanted m -Pesa. We pushed the dominant, uh, the first mover into providing uh, networks and solutions. In the end, that physical, net, net, uh, physical infrastructure cannot be replicated by those that come later. It's so expensive to replicate. So in a sense, you have to look at it in terms of an interoperability in a different sense. For me, the advantage of interoperability across payment system is that it enlarges the market and lowers the unit cost. And then it means that it becomes sustainable. But for Kenya, for example, in one of the, 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 the contributions that I've made recently is to say, we need some leasing arrangements of the physical infrastructure that can make it very, very efficient. Third, and maybe more importantly, we have to defend ourselves against uh, uh, institutional failure problems in regulatory uh, capacity. Regulatory capacity is very, very important. We want a regulator to know exactly where the constraints are and how to move the market to the next level. If we don't do that, then obviously we get to a point where we fail. And when we fail, it means that a crack a section of the market may not succeed. I think the issue and the comments worldwide is that we succeeded in Kenya, especially coming up with a rich electronic payments platform because the central bank is a regulator of banks and co co competition, uh, co co sorry, uh, communication authority is a regulator of telcos came together and agreed and understood each other. But there will be an intertwine of other, other regulators who may not understand that space. And that is where problems can emerge. I've given you examples of digital lending and all that. So these are the issues. But then we come to the main subject matter. Having, if I say those are the issues, then it means that we have to go back and say, what about the savings themselves that fintechs have really carried us, they have carried us this far. It means also those savings must be dependent very much on how do we regulate institutions or how do we sustain those institutions that are carrying our savings. And the second thing is that those savings are supposed to also generate investments. And then we have to see the path from generating savings to investments and return on those investments are going to com be commercially. So I'm happy about where we have come from. It's a good showcase, but we have to watch in terms of an institutional failure problem that can actually uh, uh, constrain the achievement in this process. Those are the points I wanted to share, which I believe that um, 
I've summarized them in a, in, a, in a way that is coming up. But then, oh, sorry, before I leave that, let me say finally, I always support that the government should tax a booming sector because essentially that is how the government can generate the resources. But we have to be careful those, so that you don't kill the goose that laid the golden egg. When I wrote, uh, there's a paper I, 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 I developed and uh, was published in Brookings, and I argued that when you tax transact, uh, uh, retail electronic transactions or uh, mobile, mobile financial services, you have to be careful that you don't create an, a, a, a reaction that there, there is a thin line between the sensitivity of those small savers or small transactors when the tax itself create a wedge. We have seen in Kenya, for example, in the recent months, in the recent years, maybe two, two three years ago, you find that there is more cash now than it was because essentially people are sensitive to the cost of transactions. So that is something that we should watch on and it's a pitfall that I'm seeing coming up. I do hope now that I'm here in this position, we can reverse this so that I don't call it a disadvantage, but I'm warning. In fact, the title of the Brookings paper was taxation of mobile phone based transactions and what should African countries learn from the Kenyan case. When I wrote that paper, the tax, the tax rate, the excise tax rate uh, VAT on the on the transactions was 10%. It is now almost 20%. You can imagine the pitfalls. So that is some of the things that we should watch, and it can actually produce some failure. So thank you very much, and sorry for taking more time than, than it was allocated to me. And thank you very much for seeing everyone. Kunal, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ungu. Actually, it was very really insightful, and I think what you the arguments you make it's so important for policymakers that to bring about what we've seen in the Kenyan success story with Ampesa and, and mobile phone transactions, there are many other things you've got to do, including physical infrastructure like fiber optics and so on, and the regulatory environment has to be supportive of this. And I think that's something that I think could be something that is useful for other, other policymakers elsewhere in Africa and on taxation too. I think it's a really important message there to getting the taxation right of this particular sector. So we can come back to that in the Q&A. But, uh, and thank you so much again. I should mention that your paper is online on our website, the UNU Wider website. It's a, perhaps the most comprehensive review one has seen of FinTech in Africa. So absolutely essential reading for everyone. And the link is then on the chat. So let's move on now to Tobias Rasmussen. Tobias, I think follows very nicely from what you've heard from Rose and Gugi and, and uh, Dr. Ndugu about issues around FinTech, around reforms, around macroeconomic uh, policies, so I would like to, ask, to ask, ask you to speak on the role of macroeconomic policy, broadly defined, uh, in augmenting domestic savings in Africa. And can financial reforms help in increasing savings rates? And if so, which type of reforms are the most effective? Because there's been quite a bit of debate about financial liberalization having not necessarily a positive effect on savings in Africa. So I wanted to, you to also reflect a little bit on this discussion of financial reforms and also macroeconomic policy. Over to you. Thank you, Kunal, and indeed, uh, honor and a pleasure to be here. I have a few slides, so let me try sharing my screen here. Okay, is that coming through? Yes. It, uh... Um, no, nope. Um, yeah, no, not yet. I think uh, Anna might have your slides, right? Um, in case you can't, you can't share it. Anna can possibly let me just try again. Sorry about this. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. There we are. Yeah, so, so um, much of this actually follows up uh, on what we already have heard from, from both Rose and, and from the CS. So here's, here's a slide uh, similar to what Rose was showing from the financial access survey in, in Kenya, uh, but more, more recent data. Uh, 
showing the the motivations uh, and and I, I don't think this has changed so much over time but I, I think an important thing I would take from this is that there is a very large precautionary motive in in savings in 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 Kenya and I, I think in in the region generally so when we think about why households save important to, to keep in mind that it, it's not just for wealth accumulation, uh, long-term uh, savings. It it's, has a very significant element of, of uh, precautionary savings, liquidity management, having some funds for an emergency, be it a, a, a medical emergency or, or, or simply just uh, expenses that perhaps lump up. So uh, I, th I think that's an important thing to keep in mind when, we, when we're talking about savings. Um, th then at the broader macro level, um, you spoke about this, uh, Kumar, and I, I think where savings really are important is that link uh, with investments. Uh, so, so this is really the, the old famous Felstein Horioka result that there is a, a correlation between savings and investment. If uh, capital was entirely mobile, uh, one might think that there would be no correlation, savings not necessarily influencing investment. But in fact, we do see uh, a significant correlation. And, and that correlation is especially strong in, in low income countries. So, so this is then linked to why we think that savings is important for investment and, and ultimately growth. Um, the chart on, on the right shows savings rates across countries. We see that in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, actually uh, overall savings rates, uh, not that different from high income countries. Uh, but lower than uh, middle income countries. And I, I think some of those countries in, in Asia that you were also uh, referring to Kumar. But uh, as Rose also had in one of her slides, we see that the savings rate in, in Kenya uh, had fallen down below that regional average, recovered a little bit in, in the past few years but it is, is still relatively low. So I, I think there is a lot uh, to be said here for uh, policies to, to boost savings generally, but uh, perhaps particularly in, in Kenya. Although I, I would also just put in the, the, the caveat of what we think about in terms of savings, how, how we measure it matters. Um, so. so in, in, in the concept of savings, you would not count, for example, uh, spending that households use to, to educate their children. But in, in, in reality, that is uh, investment uh, for, for the future. Uh, so so in, in Kenya, it is certainly the case that many families use a very large share of, of their income on educating their, their children. So perhaps that Kenyan savings rate is, is not as low as it might appear. Uh, so, so, so some caveats to keep in mind there, I think. But uh, on, on the question of policies to promote savings, so I, I would distinguish between policies at the macro level, uh, which is very much about uh, ensuring a, a stable, favorable economic environment, um, I think consistent with uh, the findings in uh, Rose's paper, uh, things like low inflation, reducing uh, the fiscal deficit, and I, I would put perhaps also the, the external, the current account deficit in, in the same category, policies to promote growth. But then also that link uh, to the precautionary element of, of savings, social protection is is, is really important. Um, here, I, I think there is an interesting ex example or, or, or policy innovation development in, in Kenya. Uh, new government uh, is moving to significantly scale up uh, the contribution rates to the national social security system. So 
um, that has the potential, I, I, I think, to work on, on two levers that are important in relation to savings. One, increase overall uh, savings in, in the economy and, and uh, provide funds for investment that way. But also, in as far as uh, that social security system is also providing social protection, uh, you're, you're addressing some of those needs that people have uh, that, that have caused them to, to, to engage in, in, uh, in precautionary savings. Uh, but how that system is, is managed is, of course, also uh, very important. Then the other category, financial reforms here, I think important to, to look for making an efficient and inclusive financial sector. Many of, of the, the agenda items there that the, the CS spoke about, healthy competition, uh, new products, and, and in particular also uh, the, the scope for expanding the reach of, of products, uh, financial inclusion through microfinance, mobile banking services, and all, all that. Um, and then the regulatory environment, uh, consumer protection, all uh, important to, to ensure that there is trust in, in the financial system. Now, as uh, example of, of uh, the importance of some of these innovations in, in the area. Um, I, I think also instructive to look at uh, a slide that Rose also had, but without uh, 2021. Um, the use of savings by instrument in, in Kenya. And, and one thing that is, is really striking in this data is the, the columns at the at the bottom, where you see bank financing uh, shooting up from uh, about 10% of, of savers using bank banks to, to save back a, a decade ago to 58% in, in 2021. And, and the growth there is really via these mobile platforms. Uh, it's uh, what the CS was talking about, the, the apps that people are able to use, linked to bank accounts, they're able to, to save easily. And policy also playing an important role there in, in 2021 following COVID, we saw the removal of some of the fees that applied for uh, moving money between mobile money accounts and uh, and, and bank accounts, so reduced transaction costs, and, and, and this uh, presumably has contributed importantly to that surge we saw in, in uh, the use of, of bank savings. You also see in this chart uh, savings on mobile money platforms themselves. These are, are the digital wallets. So that is uh, an important part of savings, uh, not uh, growing as much, but it, it's, it's been there uh, for a decade or so. These savings are, are, are not earning interest. So they're very convenient to use, but, but they don't have uh, the, the, the capacity to, to remunerate savings in the same way as the bank products do. So overall, I, I, I think a lot of, uh, of role for policies to simulate uh, innovation, uh, encourage use of, of, of savings through these new technologies. Uh, and, and, and we've seen in Kenya how this really can, can change the landscape. Overall savings, the percentage of, of people uh, that are saving has, has really increased over time. And I, I think mobile technologies and, and the regulatory environment surrounding that has has really been important. So um, let me end there and, and thank you. Thank you, Tobias. I think one important uh, issue that came up in your presentation, especially the, uh, your final graph, was increasing use of banks for savings, which is really important, I think, because banks are a source of loanable funds for investment. And that's what they're there for. And I think that's really interesting that we can see the shift over time, quite dramatically, actually, in Kenya, especially in the last uh, couple of years. 
So let me move on now to the uh, to Amir Nebdui. And I'm going to ask Amir to, Amir to speak about a particular question and issue that I think uh, needs also a lot of attention, which is that in Africa, we seem to have not too much availability of long-term capital. And if you look at capital markets, stock markets, they are underdeveloped. And yet, Africa needs long-term capital. And one of the uh, one of the ways it can do that is through sovereign wealth funds, because African uh, Africa does have several sovereign wealth funds. And Amir, of course, has a, written a very nice paper with uh, Professor Tony Addison, uh, which is now also on our, on our website, which one, again, one should take a look at. So Amir, I wanted to ask you, therefore, the question that, is, uh, that I would pose to you is, can sovereign wealth funds be a source of long-term capital for development in Africa? And then related to that, what do African policymakers need to do to maximize the development potential of sovereign wealth funds? I mean, over to you, seven minutes, if that's okay. We need some time for discussion. Too. Oh, good. Thank you, Gunal, and thanks for the invitation. It's, it's very interesting to hear those different perspectives uh, shared uh, earlier uh, in the hour. So to answer your question, uh, obviously sovereign wealth funds have become a symbol of national success, but do they really contribute to national development goals, especially in Africa? And I guess the answer is yes, but they can, but their impact depends on a variety of factors and the devil is in the details. So to answer first regarding you know, their potential contribution to future development, we need to first look at the past, right? Um, and what has been done to date, what's the track record? And this is exactly what we've done, as you mentioned, with uh, Tony Addison uh, in our recent study for, for Unwider, looking at kind of assessing the impact of seven wealth funds and thinking about their future. And several uh, insights or findings emerge. The first one is, over the past 20 years, the track record of sovereign wealth funds in Africa is quite bleak, right? Uh, the capitalization of sovereign wealth funds in Africa has shrunk by two thirds since 2013, right? So now it's a total capitalization of about um, of about uh, 50 billion dollars uh, compared to 170 billion dollars in 2013, uh, and that's the result of the end of the 2000 2010 a uh, commodity super cycle uh, and subsequent shock like the COVID-19 crisis where governments had for good reasons to draw uh, savings from there, which led to this savings. Uh, most of the capital base of several funds in Africa come from commodities, mostly oil and gas, but also mining to a less extent. Uh, and that also brings the context of the climate crisis, right? And that's why is particularly uh, relevant to wonder about the, the role of sovereign wealth funds uh, as we go into uh, an ecological uh, crisis, because this impacts considerably the optimal ways to manage savings on the African continent. Uh, and that's because Africa depends to a large extent on agricultural exports, right, which are particularly sensitive to fluctuations in temperature, in, 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 in precipitation, which also, and same with fossil fuels, right? These are, uh, they're highly at risk of the global transition where there would be considerable losses of, of income for fossil fuel exporters, countries like, you know, Algeria, Angola, Chad, Nigeria, which are highly dependent on them. So this really needs to, uh, we really need to rethink, right? The optimal public savings of those commodities and how to use them to foster development. Now, uh, the second part of the answer is that the impact of sovereign wealth funds for development, at least when we think about you know, their, their future impact. And by the way, one reason why they, they remain relevant, even if uh, they've been historically funded, right, financed by fossil fuels, right, even in the context of, of a decarbonized world, uh, it's expected that mining commodities, the prices will go up. Uh, and several African countries are key uh, producers of critical minerals. So it really reframes, it really brings back the relevance of sovereign wealth funds uh, for those countries specific. Then obviously the impact that they have on development depends on the type of sovereign wealth funds that we are, are talking about. There are different types of sovereign wealth funds and the three that uh, are worth talking about today. The first ones are fiscal stabilization funds right, to smoothen government spending. The second type are intergenerational funds and the third types are um, development funds. And the argument that we make with Tony is that even though fiscal stabilization funds are the most popular at the moment, especially in the African continent, fiscal stabilization and intergenerational funds, 
they have they're not very well suited to national development needs and they have high opportunity costs which is why in the context of long-term structural transformation it might be worth prioritizing uh development funds including national development banks even though uh, they require strong governance mechanisms now i'll briefly mention perhaps the why we think that fiscal stabilization funds are um Basically, they aim to provide a fiscal buffer in case of a shock, right? Uh, there, for example, that includes Algeria's Fonds de Régulation de Recettes or Botswana's Pula Fund. The issue is that for them to be able to cushion an external shock, they need to be large enough. And what we've seen uh, across the African continent is that it's very unlikely that a fund can be, a stabilization fund can be capitalized to the extent that will be effective in case of a massive external shock. And we've seen it with the COVID crisis where countries like where in Nigeria, the sovereign wealth fund was just not equipped to deal with uh, with uh, with the shock of the of this magnitude. The other issue is that these have very high uh, opportunity costs. That means that the funding, uh, they basically they involve uh, uh, mostly the uh, the acquisition of financial assets like uh, sovereign bonds, right, which are highly liquid. Uh, and that means that less funds are freed up for domestic development projects. And the issue also is that the returns on those on those investments uh, in liquid assets that are low yielding are typically three, four percent, right? The top of the class, the Norwegian fund is about, you know, four to five. And that raises another question in the African context because of debt servicing. Right, uh, many African countries face disfavorable uh, terms when it comes to borrowing, uh, and that means that you know many of them, uh, the interest rates on debt uh, is about is higher than six percent. Right, some even pay interest rates that are higher than ten percent, and that means that you know investing in those financial assets in those sovereign bonds bring back less money than the interest rate they have on debt servicing. So in some of those contexts, this is a very fiscally conservative argument, but it actually makes more sense to pay down national debt as opposed to invest in fiscal stabilization where you receive uh, less returns. The second point on inter intergenerational funds is that you know the idea is that non-renewable resources don't belong only to the current generation, but also to the future generations, right? So you save up for, for, for the future. However, uh, there are several issues, the returns, can be uh, quite uh, low on, on financial assets compared to development projects, development projects which can benefit current generation as well as future generations. And even if you look at things like education spending and healthcare spending, right, given high levels of mortality, infant mortality rate in the African continent, you actually benefit future generations more if you invest in maternal care, right, which ensures that more people um, actually have. Uh, uh, a healthy life, as opposed to keeping the money in financial assets and paying down to future generations in the future. Uh, and the other issue is in terms of climate risks, right? Financial assets are particularly vulnerable to uh, climatic and transition risks, which means that spending on development projects offers more uh, resilience uh, as a savings mechanism. That leaves us to development funds. Uh, and here the idea is those funds encourage national development by investing a portion of their portfolio in the equity or debt of local companies with a potential for growth, as well as domestic infrastructure. And their role is really to address market failures and capital constraints, which prevent uh, you know, industrial development and diversification in African countries. Uh, so the, their aim is really to crowd in private capital. Um, and here a few things can be said. Some exist on the African continent. I think uh, a few that need to be named are at least uh, Gabon's Strategic Investment Fund, Senegal's FANSIS, or the Ghanaian Infrastructure Investment Fund. By the way, Ghana, uh, Ghana and Nigeria are the only two African countries that have all three types of funds at once, right? Um, and so this is a, uh, uh, this helps address also existing challenges of commodity dependence, trade dependence, technological dependence. However, something that needs to be stressed is that the success of these types of funds are highly dependent on strong governance mechanisms, right? To ensure their effectiveness, 
proper public disclosure mechanisms, parliamentary oversight to show transparency in terms of how the decisions on investments are made, as well as proper uh, evaluation and, and, and uh, monitoring and evaluation mechanisms. Uh, it's also better to have one fund than two. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, and basically, just to conclude, it's hard, right, for governments to pursue uh, a consistent strategy when it comes to public savings. Uh, political expediency can often win out, especially around election time. But it's important to remember that given the uh, patterns of commodity dependence across the African continent, it's extremely important to think about uh, linking public savings with a structural transformation agenda, uh, which is why it's as clear as ever that African governments and their international partners need to take bold steps towards uh, prioritizing the right type of development finance to ensure future prosperity. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Amir. Actually, there's a question for you already in the chat, but I'll get to that question in a minute. Uh, that's a really good question, actually. Um, but I think before, uh, I want to know, uh, because we don't have much time for Q&A, I wanted to pose a question I see in the chat, which is kind of interlinked question that's coming up about Kenya, which is that um, the question is that we've seen this decline in mobile money in 2021, quite a sharp decline, which I think Toby has shown us in the graph. And there's also this question that we have a lot of increase in MFIs, microfinance institutions in Kenya, but also obviously in other African countries. So linked to, so there's two question, interlinked questions here. One is that, why are we seeing this decrease in mobile money, if it's true in Kenya? And also linked to that, microfinance institutions, how, what, how important are they? I mean, if that's, if we see this growth in their, in their number and the scale, does it, what impl implication does it have for sa savings? So can they be a vehicle for savings or not? Or are they too small and too fragmented to do that? I'm going to now go in order of the panelists. So Rose, did you want to say a little bit about what we're seeing with mobile money in Kenya? Um, if this decline that we see for only one year, is this going to be a trend or not? And also microfinance institution. And I'm going to ask that you could speak to the same question and then Tobias too. Uh, so Rose, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, th thanks Thanks very much uh, for that. Um, I'm assuming that is a uh, data that is coming from uh, uh, in access, because if you look at uh, uh, data that uh, um, is published by the Central Bank of Kenya, uh, that decline is not, uh, uh, is not feasible. So uh, it, of course, uh, during the, 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 the the corona, the corona, you know, uh, pandemic period, uh, we saw quite a quite a quite a significant increase in 2020 and 2021, and uh, probably it's the perception element that is uh, being reflected uh, uh, in the in the uh, in the fin access uh, element. Uh, when it comes to the uh, MFIs, one of the things that uh, we have in Kenya is. Uh, Two, two classes of MFI, there are those which are uh, deposit taking and they are under the, uh, the central bank uh, uh, um, uh, surveillance, of course, the, the, the ones that are taking deposits. And uh, there has been growing uh, uh, activity as far as MFIs are concerned, but at the same time, there are those uh, which have seen, um, uh, have faced some challenges and there is a, uh, uh, an element of uh, uh, patches of some of these uh, MFIs by uh, banking institutions, yeah. Uh, thank you, Rose. Uh, so Dr. Mdugu, the same question to you. I mean, do you see a, a kind of secular decline in mobile money happening in Kenya as people now shift to banks as, as we saw from what Tobia showed us uh, or not? And the other question is microfinance institutions. How important do you think they could be for mobilizing savings? I think for me, um, thank you very much. And uh, I did, I did, uh, I did raise an issue about um, taxation of mobile of, uh, mobile phone based transactions, and of course that is in itself because essentially, let's face it, essentially it was for those people who found that going to the banks and even compliance cost was very very expensive, and once we create um, a wedge between them and the cost of transactions you may find that there is a storing behavior. That's one aspect. The other aspect is that, and this is something that we have all had, 
by the time this current government came, this current administration came in, there were quite a, a sizable number of uh, people who were blacklisted by the CRBs uh, so that they could not, they could not participate in, the, in, the, in that particular market. We are just salvaging them. So in a sense, what has thrown is, is actually a, an institutional failure problem, as we can see, because they were blacklisted, some of them with as little, because there are other products. Let me, let me explain, maybe I needed to go back. And I think, I don't know whether Rose touched, touched on it. And I don't know what Tobias touched on it. One of the things has been, there has been other products that come in, have come in. And one of the most uh, maybe corporate uh, in terms of new products was actually a form of uh, a form of overdraft overdraft facility, and uh, that overdraft facility became very popular. But of course, when it is popular and easy to get, it can be abused. And at one time, there were close to uh, thirteen million uh, customers blacklisted because they were not paying the overdraft facility. So, in a sense, what you're really saying is that. It is important you bring in all so many of these products, but if you don't have as a filtering mechanism to see that they are not abused, it can work out negatively. So there's a combination of various factors. For me, I consider them as an institutional failure problem because you need to nudge the market to the optimal path. But if you create compliance costs that are so expensive, the markets, most of the customers leave the market. And that is something that uh, becomes quite critical. And I like to even Tobias the way he paraded in terms of why most people save. Most of the most of the time, it was it is actually to safeguard themselves in terms of future shortfalls. But at the same time, you have to be careful about um, where savings are. For example, if you look at uh, if, uh, if I Tobias, if you look at the time series data, you would see that when there is a bank failure, there is a major problem that takes place. Uh, especially the, the savings or even exodus of savings from banks deep because of the fear. But I don't know whether the data have reviewed that, but it's one of the areas. But I wanted to emphasize those, those two points, mm -hmm. one in terms of cost of transactions, and the second one in, um, in terms of an institutional failure problem to recognize, actually, if you create a binary tool, it becomes problematic. We need to get a better mechanism of how you filter the the, 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 the the digital lending platforms because essentially people can vote. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zindu, it's very, very helpful. Uh, Tobias, I was wondering whether you want to reflect a little bit on, on this set of, on this question very very quickly. We don't have we already a bit over time. Yes. The other, the other thing that's come up, you know, is the inflation question, right? We are seeing this high inflation happening mostly food because of food prices. Do you think that are, is coming from your perspective, are you worried about what that might mean for domestic savings? Uh, going forward. So very res uh, quick responses, if you can, please. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Maybe just on, on the first point with what we've been seeing uh, from the fine fin access survey on, on, on savings and use of, of mobile money. I, I think important to make clear that the, the question is there, are you using your balances on mobile money as, as a, a savings vehicle? This is distinct from use of, of mobile money in, in general, which definitely has been growing and, and growing sharply in terms of transaction volumes uh, and, and numbers during the, the pandemic. But what we've been seeing in, in the 2001, 2021 data is uh, that people are perhaps not using those balances as much as uh, mobile bank connected savings uh, applications. And, and I think uh, that ties in with some of the points the, the CS was making. People are, are looking for convenience. They are looking for uh, reducing transaction costs. And, and when uh, those fees for transferring funds between your mobile money account and, and your, uh, your bank accounts on, on your phone were reduced, that caused, uh, I think, uh, a, a big upsurge in, in the use of, of savings on, on those bank platforms. So uh, in, important to make that distinction, I think, between the, the, the savings that numbers we're seeing and, and use of mobile uh, money as, as a payment, payment platform. Uh, 
Right. On, on the other question of uh, in inflation, so yes, of, of course, across the world, if, if, if we're looking at an environment where we're uh, having sustained much higher inflation, that, that is something to worry about. Uh, we, we would all hope that inflation is, is reduced uh, and, and comes back into to target levels. Otherwise, I, I, I do uh, worry that that could have negative implications on, on not just savings, but also investment levels. We, we, we want to get back to that macro stability. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. That, that's, uh, and obviously, once you have high inflation, we can also have negative real deposit rates, which is clearly not at all helpful for financial savings. Um, but let me now move to Amir. Amir, there was already a question, which I noticed that your co-author, Tony Addison, has kind of answered for you, um, which is the question of, you know, that a sovereign wealth fund is not just one objective, it's a multiple objectives, right? So is it easy to separate out uh, the stabilization objective from the intergenerational uh, transfer objective from the development bank objective? So quick response on that. Another question came up in the chat is, well, we're moving to this world of clean energy. So what's the future of sovereign funds, which are, as you, as you argued, is very much funded by commodity price uh, uh, from commodities itself. So what's the future then? I think you sort of suggest there's still a future. So maybe you can quickly answer in yeah. uh, less than a minute if you can. Thank you. Yeah, I'll be very quick, especially as Tony already started to answer. On the first, on Santiago's question, it's true that sovereign funds with more than one objectives uh, or more than one fund exist, uh, like Botswana Pula Fund or Mozambique's perspective uh, fund that have both stabilization and intergenerational savings objectives. But, um, but the problem is when the purpose of each of a fund isn't clear, the governance becomes harder, right? So, uh, and in a way, the, if it's a single fund, then the portfolio should reflect that um, with the relative weight of each objective to policymakers. So running several funds that are separate entails additional administration, but at least it has the merit of having uh, only waiting one objective. Uh, there's only one objective against which to match assets. On the second question, that's a very important question. And that's why the role of the fund is uh, becomes even more crucial in terms of helping the transition, right? Helping sustain uh, returns uh, even after non-renewable resources deplete or after fossil fuels, the demand drop because of decarbonization. So they should have a climate mandate as well, especially when, when, when the revenues come from fossil fuels, which means that the standard policy advice is not suited and turning towards a development fund uh, is perhaps more uh, advisable. Thank you. Thanks, Amir. I, mean, I noticed that there's still more questions coming in the chat, but unfortunately, we are definitely out of time, actually. Um, thanks so much to, uh, to Rose and Gugi, uh, to Ndugu, especially I know how busy uh, schedule that you have and to give us some time for this, uh, for this panel, uh, Tobias Rasmussen and Amir Levdui. And of course, again, a lot of this was presented back by really good papers that are on our website. So do take a look at that. And thanks so much to the audience for really nice questions, for a very active uh, participation. And uh, again, looking forward to seeing all of you uh, virtually in the next webinar, which we'll have in March. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care. Bye.